Hello, and welcome to The Course. I'm your host today, Martha Marion, and I'm speaking with Professor Shaoda Wong from the Harris School of Public Policy. Professor Wong is a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and also serves as the deputy faculty director of the Energy Policy Institute at UChicago China Center. He is an applied economist with a regional focus on China, holds a BA from Peking University and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He is here to talk about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Wong. Uh, thanks for having me. So my name is Shadow Wang. Uh, I'm an economist working on political economy, developing economics, and environmental economics with a focus on China. Lovely. So yeah, let's let's go back in time a little bit. Um, so this goes back to high school for you. I would love to know about sort of the origin of how you became interested in this field of study. So uh, when I was really young, right before high school, mm-hmm. the dream was to become a soccer player. I quickly realized that, you know, this was not going to work out. And uh, in high school, I fell in love with physics. Mm. Uh, I thought, you know, using very elegant and rigorous models to explain how things work gives me, like, tremendous intellectual joy. But I wasn't sure whether I wanted to become a physicist at the time because, uh, you know, I feel like despite the intellectual joy, there was a missing piece. I, I always wanted to do something about China. And mm-hmm. you know, physics is something more general. It didn't allow me to to have that connection. And if I may ask, where where were you in school at that time? Like, where were you living at that time? Yeah, so I I grew up in China, went to high school, college in China before I came to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so you were interested in how this applied to China because that was your community and your work and like the world you were living in. Yes. Yes, and I also think that's part of the, the culture, right? Like, you know, mm-hmm. it's someone who grew up, you know, being nurtured by the Chinese culture and, and Chinese history. There's always this uh, sense that, you know, as a scholar, the, the mission is to use your intellectual abilities and, and your knowledge to contribute to the society. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I love physics. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to become a physicist. And then I remember one day in 2008, so I was watching TV, and there was this documentary about a Chinese economist named Justin Lin, who is actually a U Chicago alumnus. He did mm. his PhD at U Chicago, uh, you know, several decades ago. So at the time, Justin Lin was appointed uh, by the World Bank as their new chief economist. So that documentary was about you know his life story. He has a legendary story uh, if you Google him. But you know, in that documentary, basically, he was asked. And what's the mission of him as a World Bank? And he answered that uh, the mission is to eliminate poverty globally. Mm-hmm. And that really attracted me. So after the documentary, I started uh, searching the books written by Justin Lin. And he happened to have this methodology book on economics and also a book on demystifying the Chinese economy. So, so after reading these books, I realized that you know, economics works very much like physics, where we use very simple, uh, elegant tools to explain how things work, how people work. And then uh, from the Chinese economy book, I realized that, you know, all these insights, all these tools can be applied to solving China's problems. So that really got me hooked. And and after that, I was 100% sure this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, Actually, can you go into more detail about, I love that, that the analogy you made between physics and economics about creating these simple tools to explain how things work. And specifically, you're interested in demystifying the Chinese economy. Could you speak just a little bit about what what that means to you in terms of what are those simple tools to break down how how to explain that to folks? Mm -hmm. So so basically, you know, in physics, when we see something, we want to explain how that happens. So then we come up with very simple theoretical hypotheses and then we can verify this hypothesis using experiments. We can run randomized lab experiments to understand you know, whether this is a bad hypothesis or this is a wrong hypothesis. And once you know, we can verify a hypothesis, then we can use that to guide how we do things. Right? It can be applied mm-hmm. to engineering, to, to all those uh, different uh, settings. And in economics, it's kind of the same. Right? So we see you know, some countries are rich, some countries are poor. Right? In the case of China, you know, for 2,000 years, 
China was the largest economy globally, and then over the past two or three hundred years, we saw a dramatic decline of the country. And then, you know, a big part of economics is trying to understand, you know, why are so countries much richer than others, and you know how to develop uh, the the the, the uh, so so a big part of economics is to understand, you know, why are so some countries so much richer than others, and you know how can we help develop those. Uh, economies that are still lagging behind. Yeah, so in essence, you know, my field is developing economics. I try to understand, you know, whether some policies can help eliminate poverty, can help reduce hunger, can help produce, uh, can help promote education, so on and so forth. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for that clarification and that expansion. So you you read this and you're now certain of the path you want to take. How, what is the first step you took in making that path a reality? Yeah, so the first path is that I need to be able to get into a good university uh, and major in economics. Mm-hmm. So uh, in China, what happens is that you choose your major before you enter into college and you take this hyper competitive uh, college entrance exam in order to get into a good college. And, you know, at the time, Economics was the most popular major by far. So I had to uh, work hard in high school in order to yeah. become an econ major in mm-hmm. college. I actually went to Justin Lin's university and, and you know, I, I took his course when he returned from the World Bank and he actually wrote me a letter for a graduate school application. Yeah, actually, no, I want to stay on there for a minute because this is a person that had really inspired you. How did it feel to meet this person and then also have them as a... Uh, you know, a professor and perhaps even a mentor, what was that relationship like? Um, you know, so in most cases, right, when you, when you meet your childhood idol, right. it's <laughs> it's like, sounds a little bit rosy, but <laughs> you demystify those guys and then, you know, right. they no longer have the aura that, that they used to have mm-hmm. uh, in your mind. You know, but, but in this case, I think that that was not the case. So um, when I took his course, and I have already read most of his books, but I still learned a lot from him, mm-hmm. just the way he treats research. So I, I still remember, you know, in his class, I was presenting this undergraduate project. And, you know, I wanted to talk about something about, you know, how uh, school closures happened in China over the past two decades, you know, why we saw a mm-hmm. dramatic decrease in the number of primary schools in the rural areas. And then I remember there, there was this tiny little detail in the data and, you know, I, I didn't pay much attention, you know, because it wasn't the focus of the paper, but, you know, Justin just wouldn't like, let me go to the other slide until we figure out, mm-hmm. you know, what happened to that very small part of the data. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that, that's something that really stayed with me afterwards. Every time I present something nowadays, I always imagine, you know, what if there is someone like that in the audience? So I need to really master every single detail of my talk. Yeah. So what are the things you're learning at that time and how is it helping shape what you want to do with that degree in this and the knowledge? Yeah. So basically in college, I was a hundred percent sure that, you know, I wanted to do a PhD in economics. I want to become a professor uh, in this field. And honestly, as a, as a time, the, the dream was to uh, come to U Chicago to do my PhD because, you know, Modern economics was built on the Chicago School of Economics in some sense. So when I applied to graduate school, I, I actually did not get into U Chicago, but I got into another good program at, at UC Berkeley. Uh, so I, I spent uh, five years there. And uh, when I look back, I think you know what I took away the most from the college years was that you know I I really had the opportunity to understand China better. And I think you know the the college years were transformational. Mm-hmm. To to many people, and you know nowadays, if I look at my friends, uh, you know some of them did college in China, some of them did college in the U.S., and I can see a very clear difference in the way they think about China. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, so like for most Chinese students, what happens in high school is that you, know, you just spend all your time learning and preparing for the college entrance exam, so on and so forth. So it's really after you get into college, you start interacting. With other people, we start, you know, sensing the society in a much mm-hmm. deeper way. 
Right, so in college, you know, I had a lot, a, a lot of opportunities to uh, conduct field works, you know, go to field trips, uh, you know, talk to the villagers, the local bureaucrats, the business people. And I think I got a lot of insights from those visits. Some of those insights may not directly contribute to my research, but it gives me an intuition yes. about, you know, how the society functions. Yeah, well, I, I would love to know at least a couple of those insights or things you learned as a person who's never um, been to those villages, what were people telling you about? Yeah, so it's mostly about, you know, how people think. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time talking to different bureaucrats, right? You know, at the village level, people in the village council, but also, you know, township bureaucrats, county bureaucrats, prefectural bureaucrats, so on and so forth. And you can see, you know, how people at different levels in different positions have different perspectives about the same policy, about the same uh, economic phenomenon, so on and so forth. So this helps me understand uh, their objective functions and also the constraints that yeah. they're facing in different places. And this is really useful because you know, when there's a new policy or when there's a new economic phenomenon, that intuition allows me to think through how different actors in this economic system are going to respond to the same shock. In, in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so much sense because it seems like what you're talking about is integrating, like obviously you're looking at data, but if you only look at data, you're not seeing these on the ground, multiple perspectives of how people's feelings about policy affect the implementation. Yes. Yeah, and and like all of those diverse perspectives. So you talk a lot about like, or on your website, it talks about like political, environmental, and applied economy. So you're clearly interested in not just theoretical, but how this really affects people's lives. How was your time talking with people in those villages? Mm -hmm. How has that affected how you think about applied economics in the real world? Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe I can give you an example. The example is my PhD dissertation at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a paper about understanding the economic cost of environmental regulation in China. So mm -hmm. we saw the Chinese government spending so much effort trying to reduce pollution over the past uh, two decades, and very little has been done about you know what, what are the economic consequences of all these efforts. And the, the challenge of studying something like that is that environmental regulation was not randomly assigned to different regions. So we cannot simply compare a region with more regulation to another region with you know, less regulation, uh, compare their economic outcomes and attribute that difference in economic outcomes just to environmental regulation, because there are many other differences uh, between these different regions. And so ideally, in economics, what we want is so-called a natural experiment. Uh, we want a setting where the stringency of environmental regulation is almost as good as randomly assigned across different mm -hmm. firms or across uh, different areas. And the question is that, as it, the question is that you know, how do we find a setting like that? And so yeah. when I was thinking about this question, I recalled the conversations that I had with the local bureaucrats about environmental regulation, and particularly uh, water regulation. Mm -hmm. So what I was told is that basically the central government built those centralized water monitoring stations along the major river trunks. And the water monitoring stations collect water quality at that specific location. And the central government uses that water quality information to determine the promotion cases of the local guys. Right? So if you deliver good, local, uh, good water quality, you get promoted. If you deliver bad water quality, you, you get demoted or you don't get promoted. And so then the problem I heard from the local guys is that you know, those water monitoring stations, because the river only flow one way, Mm -hmm. but they can only capture pollution coming from the upstream, but they don't reflect any pollution coming from the downstream. And so then that gave me the intuition that, you know, since the local guys are trying to maximize water quality readings at a specific location, then, you know, they're going to have a lot of incentives to regulate firms right. in the immediate upstream of the station. Right. And they're going to have very little incentives to regulate firms in the immediate downstream. Yep. And so so that then there are hundreds of those water monitoring stations so in the data, we may expect to see hundreds of discontinuities yeah, in regulatory stringency. 
And so I brought this idea to the data and that was indeed the case. So, so I wrote a paper on you know, how regulating water quality affects the productivity of manufacturing firms nationwide. That, that makes so much sense. And like when you, like at that dissertation, when you did it, was that a novel concept for people? Like how, how was that, how was your dissertation received? I mean, it got me the job at U Chicago. So hey, all right. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually, yeah, Lowell, let's go to there. So you, so you got your master's at Berkeley and PhD or am I missing a step? Uh, yes. So I, I, so basically, you know, I graduated from college. I, I directly did a PhD, but I think they give you a master's degree along the way for free. I mean, well done. Um, yeah, actually. And then, so knowing that that helped you get the job at UChicago, I do want to spend a moment thinking about who is possibly listening to this conversation um, to think about what were the, like, you know, once you get the degrees and get the jobs, it's like, well, this was my path. But what were the challenges along the way? Like your, the process of getting your master's, the process of getting your PhD that um, you learned, you know, along the way and would, you know, tell people about if they were about to go into the process? Yeah, so I think one thing I really mastered over the years is how to deal with rejections and mm. negative feedback. And uh, because if you look at the academic life, the 90% of that is dealing with rejections. But every time you submit a paper, there's a 95% chance that you're going to have a rejection. Every time you present a paper, it was the, it's the job of the audience to tell you what you did wrong mm. and mm -hmm. what you need to fix, so on and so forth. And so this means that you know we live in an environment where we pour our you know blood and, and you know tears Sweat. into our it's work, time. yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then you know for ninety percent of the time we receive very negative feedback on that. And you know people tend to say, don't take this professional feedback personally. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not possible right? because right. we invested everything into those projects, and right? we we sacrificed. In the quality time with family, friends, you know, with my dog, so on and so forth. So, so how can I not take it personally when, when some people criticize uh, the work that I invested so much in? What I do is that you know, whenever I, I have a rejection, whenever I, I face some critique that I think is unfair, I allow myself to have like two or three days where mm -hmm. I get really pissed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then after that, I try to calm down and I try to zoom out and, and look at the bigger picture. But the bigger picture is that, you know, I choose this profession because I believe in the power of economics. I believe that, you know, through good economic research, we can make the world a better place. We can improve policy outcomes. We can, you know, help uh, improve people's livelihood, so on and so forth. So given that bigger picture, if I still believe in that, you know, despite the small setbacks, I should just, you know, shut up and keep moving <laughs> forward. Yes, that, that, you know, that's the, the, the process that I formed over the years. Yeah. Well, and it seems like what you're describing is a process of, of getting a harder shell around rejection without becoming a hard person. Like you still seem like a very open hearted person that is trying to make the world a better place. And I think that's a tricky balance to get right where it's like I can get over rejection, but I'm not closing myself off to, you know my mission and feelings. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, you know, if you love this subject, if you love this topic enough, you couldn't allow yourself to be that cynical about this whole thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that makes me want to hear a little bit of, of the mission statement. You've said some of it already, but I think it's really useful for people to hear someone just speak their passion so what it you know what is the world you want to see, and how do you think um, deep study and teaching and research on economics can get us there? Yeah. So, okay. So at the University of Chicago, I actually teach two courses. Uh, one is on the Chinese economy, and the other is on uh, environmental economics. And I consider these two topics to be of the greatest importance mm -hmm. to the world that we live in today the rise of China and also in our environment. 
And so basically, I think people have a lot of irrational or you know, wrong perceptions about these very important topics. And through my research and through my teaching, I want to help people think about these questions more clearly and probably help policymakers make better decisions about these very high-stake issues. Well, well, yeah, what have, you, what have you found when you are trying to talk to policymakers about your work? And how can you help them understand what needs to happen? You know, from several pieces of my research, I tried very hard to communicate with the policymakers. And the one thing I learned is that, you know, we need to pay a lot of attention to the different objective functions mm-hmm. of the policymakers and of the academics. Right. So from our perspective, we try to write you know, super rigorous papers, trying to pin down all the small details in the analysis so and so forth. But from the policymakers' perspective, you know, they're trying to stay in office, get reelected, get promoted, so on and so forth. So, so they don't necessarily care that much about the rigor of the study, but more you know, how the study is going to be perceived by the more general public right. when we use that to, to inform policy. So that's something you know we need to figure out when communicating academic ideas to, to policymakers. That makes sense. So, a- as an academic, let's go back to the story of how you ended up at University of Chicago. So you're finishing your PhD. Walk me through the your journey from there to where you currently teach and work. Yeah. So it's actually a funny story because typically when people finish their PhD in economics. They apply to like 200, 300 jobs, like all the, all the jobs in the US. And then, you know, they, they get a lot of interviews and then they get several offers. And in my case, I was in my fifth year in PhD. I wasn't sure that I wanted to graduate in that year or wait for another year. And at that time, I saw this job at another university, but the job description seemed like it was written for me. It seemed perfect. Mm. So I decided, you know, maybe I don't go on a full market in my fifth year. Instead, I just applied to that one job. Yeah, so that's what I did. And then my advisors told me, you know, given that you have already prepared all the materials, you know, this is a big fixed cost, it's probably a good idea to apply to like two or three other positions. Mm -hmm. It was original one. And so then I I did a search on the internet. I found the UChicago position. So I decided, you know, this looks really cool and, you know, this is like a moonshot because you should probably was always my dream school and I didn't get into it in my PhD, but you know, what the hell, I'm just going to try it anyways. And it turned out that I got the Chicago job. I didn't got the original job because I did apply. Wow. What, what did that feel like to be like, well, this is my moonshot. It's probably not going to happen. What was that moment like when you found out you got it? Well, I, it gave me imposter syndrome for a while, but sure. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> But have been enjoying it so much over the past few years. Yeah. What do you specifically love about teaching? I think, you know, the process of communicating economic ideas to other people, mm-hmm. it gives me a lot of pleasure in itself. And in addition to that, knowing that, you know, through my teaching, I may be able to change, you know, how future policymakers or business leaders think about China, think about climate issues. Those things, you know, those are topics that are really close to my heart. That gives me additional joy in mm-hmm. the process. What is something or a couple of things you have learned about the life of an academic, the life of an economist that you never could have anticipated when you came into the field? Yeah, I guess I didn't have a very clear idea of how the life of an economist looks like. Mm-hmm. But in that sense, I didn't receive any shock because I had no prior at all right. when I started. I just had this very vague dream of eliminating poverty, yeah. but that's, that was about it. Well, what, what does it look like? What does the life of an economist look like from your vantage point? I think it's probably similar to most other academics in the sense that, you know, you spend time teaching, you spend a lot, a lot of time uh, doing your research, writing your papers, doing data analysis, you know, talking to students, advising students, you go to seminars, conferences, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. 
And speaking of research, what is the research you're doing right now? Sort of what in this moment is the most exciting to you in terms of what you're researching and learning? Yeah, so right now, or over the past two or three years, I got really interested in law and economics, which is the intersection between legal studies and uh, mm. economic research. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have this uh, recent paper on, you know, how decoupling local governments from local courts can reduce judicial local protectionism in China and how that can foster interregional investment, uh, foster economic integration, so on and so forth. Right, so through conducting this research, I got to know another field, uh, which is in you know, legal studies. And it opened up a lot of new insights and new research opportunities for me. Yeah. So, so I'm very excited about that right now. Wow. Yeah, that's, I mean, that seems, I have so many questions, but we have so little time now. Um, so I have two, two final questions. One is, what do you wish, since China is such a, the economics of China is such a focus of your work, what do you wish people outside of China knew? about the economics of China that most people outside of China do not know? Well, I can spend like a week <laughs> talking about <laughs> the of it. But let, let me say one thing. I, I think you know, no matter how people feel about China in the US, it's always a better idea. It's always a good idea to have a better understanding of the country. So I was told this story uh, by a colleague at Stanford University where you know, they had this program that tried to educate the policymakers in the U.S. about China. So what they did was that, you know, they, they go to all the websites uh, of the government and then they found everyone in D.C. In whose job title, there's the word China. So they found hundreds of people with job title, including the word China. Mm. And then, you know, they had one-on-one meeting with every single one of them, asking them, you know, what do you want to know about China? And the questions that those people asked were simply terrifying. It showed that, you know, they had absolutely zero understanding of China, but they are the ones that are making policies about China. And so that's scary because, you know, if I think about myself, I have spent more than a decade in the U.S. right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I speak English, I read the newspapers, I talk to my colleagues, I live here, I work here, I study here. But I wouldn't consider myself a U.S. expert. And I definitely wouldn't feel qualified to advise the Chinese government on U.S. policy. Right, so... It's the asymmetry of understanding between the two countries is something very dangerous for the whole world. And I really hope that you know, through my own research, through my, through my own teaching, I can improve that at least a little bit on the margin. So, you know, this, this path obviously is still unfolding for you, but it starts even just before high school. If you were to go back and be able to speak to your high school self, about what your life looks like now, what would you tell him? Well, I would tell him that, you know, life is great. Just keep working hard and, you know, someday it will pay off. Thank you, Professor Shaoda Wang, for your time today and course takers. If you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more, and thanks for listening.